from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., call on Congress. The program discussing national issues that affect Oklahoma. Your host, U.S. Representative Tom Cole. Thank you for joining me today for another edition of Cole on Congress. Today we're privileged to have as our guest from the great Hawkeye State, Congressman Tom Latham, representing Central Iowa. Congressman Latham is the dean of his state's delegation in the House of Representatives. In addition to his service in Congress, Representative Latham has also served as lo on local and state issues as a voice for our nation's agricultural interests. Tom was raised on a farm and grew up helping his family uh, chop their small uh, business or run their small business, excuse me. Maybe you did chop it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, armed with that personal experience and degrees in agriculture and business, uh, Tom's considered an authority on agricultural issues in Congress, and his opinions on that matter are widely respected by both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, he's also a friend and trusted colleague, and I'm pleased to have him with here, here with us today on this show. Welcome. Good to have you, Tom. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. I actually consider Iowa's second uh, home since I married a good Iowa girl and actually went to one of the few Republicans to ever graduate from Grinnell College in central <laughs> Iowa, citadel of uh, liberalism. But uh, right. if you can, tell us, the audience, a little bit about uh, your background growing up on a farm and your understanding of agriculture that came from that. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today and uh, for your leadership here in Congress. You uh, are a great example of, uh, of the type of person who needs to come to Congress to represent the interests of your, your folks at home. You do a great job and, and your committee assignments are obviously very important for Oklahoma and for the nation. But uh, uh, yeah, I grew up uh, uh, on a farm about a mile and a half outside of a town of 160 people. And uh, I've got four uh, older brothers, and uh, if my father believed in anything, it was hard work. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he was fortunate to have five sons. And uh, he, he tried about everything in agriculture, different uh, livestock, different crops. Uh, and he graduated from Iowa State University in dairy husbandry, and, uh, but he ended up actually in the, in the seed business. And back in uh, 1947, I think it was, there was a smut infestation on oats, and so he bought a treater to treat the oats for seed the next year, then he bought a cleaner and set that up in the granary there on the farm, and uh, uh, gave us the opportunity to not only farm itself, but to understand agriculture. And uh, we all worked uh, in, in the business. Uh, now we do business on our, our family business in about six states in the upper Midwest and uh, primarily soybeans. But, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just a true example if you really work hard, if you do, uh, you try to do the right thing all the time, you can be successful in this country. And, of course, agriculture is something that I love. and, and uh, will always be a part of my life. So. What got you out of, uh, obviously, a very successful career in agriculture yeah. into the public arena? Well, I was involved, uh, you know, the, we had the Iowa caucuses. And uh, back <laughs> All in... All America <laughs> knows about the oh, Iowa they caucuses. They certainly do, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. But uh, uh, back in 1976, I went to a, a Republican caucus in... Wisner Township, which doesn't even have a town in it, and a neighbor's house. We went over there, and I made the mistake of raising my hand, saying, "You know, they asked who wanted to be on the county central committee," and I said, "I'll do it." And, and uh, so I was active there. I became county chairman, and then I got active on the district basis, and uh, uh, was elected to the state central committee. Was actually treasurer of the state party, and then, if you remember, Fred Grandy, who's Very well, probably yeah. uh, most. Uh, People know him from being gopher on the love boat, <laughs> but uh, he was our congressman in northwest Iowa at that time, and he decided he wanted to run the primary for governor, and that opened it up. And, and having been involved and people knowing my background, I had a lot of encouragement to, to run for Congress. But the thing that motivated me, and if you remember back, uh, back in 1993, the, the retroactive tax increase that was put in place, the uh, government takeover of health care, 
And, you know, from a small business background, this is devastating stuff. And uh, I really was, was motivated because of what the federal government was doing on the regulatory basis, on the tax basis, to small businesses for them to be successful. And whether you're in agriculture and small business or any kind of small business, you, you pay the bills for all these big government ideas. And uh, so I was, uh, I got mad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was fortunate to get elected in 1994 with the, the new majority class, and uh, uh, it, it's been a, a great experience these past little over 13 years now in Congress to to try and keep your focus on on what brought you here and why you're here. Now you've seen extraordinary changes in agriculture, particularly in Iowa agriculture. I mean, it reverberates down to us. I, in my district, I've got 14,000 farms and ranches, so we're substantial, uh, you know, agricultural district. Uh, and we're seeing, of course, $10 wheat prices and uh, pretty decent cattle prices. Uh, uh, but uh, a lot of that stems out of changes that have come in Iowa. Right. Uh, what are the nature of those changes? Well, I, I think, first of all, the the, the huge change in Iowa is just the renewable fuels, the ethanol, the biomass, you know, soy diesel, those type of things, uh, which has created an unbelievable amount of investment in, in my district and in the state of Iowa. I have probably the best agricultural land overall in, in Iowa in my district. Uh, but we've seen opportunities today like we have never seen before. Uh, I, you know, I'll tell you, you know, 45, 50 good paying jobs in Chicago or New York or something is no big deal. But when you're from Alexander, Iowa, in a town of 160, and somebody builds an ethanol plant there, and there's 45, 50 really good jobs, it makes a huge difference. And we have an opportunity now to to have our young people actually come back, stay or stay there, and not just have jobs, but have careers in agriculture, new opportunities that we've never seen before. Uh, you know, with the energy bill that was passed just before the end of the year last year and with renewable energy standards in that, it's going to guarantee on a long-term basis that we do have opportunities. But uh, the frustration I have is that we, we cannot do it all. Obviously, ethanol isn't going to take care of our problem, our dependence on foreign oil or soy diesel, whatever. We've got to be able to use all the resources that we have in this country, you know, oil and gas, and be able to explore and, and capture those resources. That's the answer to independence is a coordinated effort. Uh, but uh, I tell you, in, in Iowa and throughout agriculture today, uh, there are opportunities that we have never seen, uh, certainly not in my lifetime, have ever seen before as far as investment and growth and opportunities in rural America. Now those opportunities are also linked very much to the international marketplace. In the days of, uh, uh, of us not you know, being dependent on the farm on, on exports, of course we've been dependent for a long time. In Oklahoma we export 80% mm -hmm. of our winter wheat beyond the continental United States. So. That's huge. What about Iowa? What are the export uh, possibilities for Iowans? Well, there, that's obviously uh, makes the difference. On uh, and if you look at price discovery on any commodity, it's at that margin is whether you have a shortage or you have a surplus, and that's what makes price. And so, obviously, our export markets are continue to be extremely important for us. And uh, we uh, export a lot of corn to to Mexico, overseas, uh, around the world. Half of uh, every uh, bush or you know every other row of soybeans grown in Iowa is exported, and that is a huge market because there's a world demand for protein, and that's what we're talking about. Actually, we're not. Everybody talks about corn or wheat or soybeans. You're talking about protein uh, to feed the world outside and to have. Uh, opportunities, but that's what makes markets. That's what uh, is absolutely critical for us to keep those markets open overseas. We've got to have fair trade. I mean, obviously, we have some uh, competitors in the national marketplace that uh, want to manipulate their currency, like China and places like that. But uh, uh, to close down or shut the doors in the United States would be devastating in so many different areas in agriculture. Uh, would be particularly devastating. Do you have any concerns? We've heard a lot of discussion, obviously, in a very political year, about trade policy going forward. And it's usually cast uh, in the rhetoric of the United States losing jobs mm -hmm. and losing opportunities. 
uh, whereas we've seen very different things, at least in parts of rural Oklahoma. Uh, do you have any concerns about where we're headed in terms of uh, global trade in the next few years? I, I do. Uh, and when I hear some of the rhetoric that's out there today about closing our borders, about uh, us being on the defensive as far as trade, we, we have the innovative people in this country, the ideas, the new inventions, and that's, that's what we export best. What we've got to have, I believe, Tom, uh, is that we've got to have a climate for business in the United States so that we can keep those jobs here. We currently, as far as c corporate tax rates, are, I think, first or second highest in the world. Uh, not a great incentive to keep businesses here. Uh, we have a regulatory scheme uh, throughout the uh, our, our country that is uh, more expensive, more onerous than, than any other country in the world. And as a small business person, uh, the expense that we put in just to comply with some of these regulations, you fill out a form and it goes in some bureaucrat's file someplace and never to be seen again. But if they find out it's not there, you're you know fined fifty or hundred thousand dollars in no value. But uh, uh, you know the. It isn't about wages. It, it really isn't. It's, it's about taxes. It's about regulatory schemes. And it's about litigation. We have the most uh, lawsuits any place in the world. And uh, it costs a lot of money. And it makes us much less competitive around the world. So uh, people talk about jobs going offshore. You know, the American worker is about 20 times more productive than the worker in China is. Because we have the innovation, we have the uh, the, the ability to produce things uh, at a so much better quality, but also uh, efficiently than any place else in the world. But the thing that's holding us back is some of our own uh, policies that we put in place in this country. In terms of you also, in addition to being obviously an expert on agriculture and what American agriculture policy should be, you sit on the Appropriations mm -hmm. Committee. And, uh, you know, probably one of the great challenges we have in front of us is controlling our own spending appetites as a government. So what, what do you see as the main struggles coming up on the, on the spending front? Well, you know, as a, and someone who serves on the Appropriations Committee, I get a little bit, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say sensitive, but I'm very much aware <laughs> of all the debate about earmarks and, uh, uh, people don't understand. I, I'll do town meetings at home. I'll say uh, everybody that thinks that earmarks are, you know, 30 percent of the budget. You know, you'll have four or five hands go up. How about 20 percent? You know, another group, 10 percent, and you have over half the people saying that half, you know, 10 percent of the budget. It's actually about six tenths of one percent. And uh, the fiscal year 07, uh, we had no earmarks. We didn't save a dime as far as the federal spending because all we did was turn over everything to the uh, to the bureaucrats. Now, there are some crazy things that people have done here which are outrageous. We've got to change how uh, we do earmarks or congressionally designated uh, funding of projects. So there's total transparency. There is uh, a, a way for people to be held accountable uh, in the system. But uh, I don't want to turn over the, the entire federal government budget to some bureaucrat that doesn't know where Norman, Oklahoma is or doesn't know where Alexander, Iowa is and could care less. Uh, I think that's part of our job here. But you know as well as I do, it's uh, the non-defense, non-homeland security part of discretionary part of the budget has been basically flat. The thing that's grown on discretion has been discretionary side is the uh, the military and homeland security. But the gorilla that's facing the federal government is in the entitlement part. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all the welfare programs. That's where the huge unsustainable growth is in our budget. And it will consume the rest of the budget very shortly if we do not uh, uh, have the political will to stand up and make some tough decisions around here. That's exactly one of the uh, the issues that uh, I try to educate my constituents about that they it, that surprises them. That, uh, that actually the Appropriations Committee is actually only appropriating about 38 cents of every right. federal dollar. The rest right. of it is mandatory, automatic right. spending. Uh, 
that's very popular. Everybody's for mm-hmm. Social Security. Everybody's sure. for Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, where they tell me they're against spending so much and then add the, the additional things that we need uh, uh, from their perspective. Uh, how do you get your hands around that kind of problem? What are some of the ideas that are being kicked around in Congress that might begin to allow us to address the entitlement challenge? Well, I, uh, number one, it's going to take political will. Uh, everybody talks about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid as being the third rail of politics, that if you touch that third rail, you're electrocuted, you're out of office, basically. But we need leadership, and uh, you know there are a lot of ideas out there when you look at Social Security, whether you're talking about raising the retirement age, whether you're talking about raising the the, ta- the uh, uh, income level in which Social Security uh, benefits are, are taken out or the tax is taken out. Uh, you could make a lot of different changes that politically probably are pretty tough to do. Uh, and, and, and Medicare really is more of an immediate problem than even Social Security is. But uh, you know as well as I do around here that if you try to just slow down the rate of growth of programs, say from uh, like we did uh, two years ago, you know, from 7.3% increase to 7.1% increase, that's, you know, you're going to get huge ads run against you at home saying that you're cutting Medicare, that you're throwing poor seniors out, which is not true at all, but we've got to find a way to slow down the rate of growth. I didn't run for Congress to uh, you know, to make myself you know, more grand or something like that. I did it because I've got three kids, I've got four grandkids, and they're paying the bill, or they're going to pay the bill for all the things that we're doing now. All these promises that are out there, those are the kids that are going to have to pay the bill. And I, I wish that somehow we would change the system here so that we're not just talking about an annual budget uh, that has little or no change in it, that we have uh, some people who will look forward out there 20, 30, 40 years and make those, and they can be very subtle changes today that make a huge difference if you understand uh, the value of of money over time, uh, the miracle of compound interest, things like that, uh, make a huge difference if we just do some small things now, but it's going to take political leadership, and quite honestly, unfortunately, I don't hear anybody talking about it right now. You know, I have the same uh, experience at town meetings. I just finished a round of them, and uh, uh, Social Security always comes up. And I always point out that the people asking it are usually my age and older. You know, you're, I'm, in sure. my, I'm 58. So I, you're uh, a kid. I, yeah, I'm a kid. Compared to me. Well, I always tell them, <laughs> you, you know, if you're my age or, you know, 50 and above, you really don't have a problem. Right. We're not going to make any changes that are going to affect you. The people that ought to be asking the tough questions here are all in their 20s. Right. Uh, I remember a few years ago getting a call from my son. He'd gotten his first paying job, and he called me up and said, Dad, I just got the first four-digit paycheck of my life. I said, that's great. And he said, yeah, and you can't believe how much you guys are taking out of this thing. You need to do something. And we laughed. And then I thought, you know, when I got my first four-digit paycheck, or three-digit, actually, which was a big check, um, Social Security tax was just over 3%, now 6.1. I didn't right. even have to pay Medicare on my very first checks because there was no Medicare program. Right. Now exactly. he's paying it on every dime that he's going to earn for the rest of his life for a program that uh, he's still 40 years away from being able to participate in. Uh, you know, that is an incredible burden and expense on right. young people. Well, it's just not sustainable. I mean, actuarially, if you look out to the future, uh, it, it is not sustainable. You're either going to get to the point where the programs have to be drastically slashed or taxes raised to the point where basically the economy is dead in the water. Uh, this, it, it is a crisis that's looming out there. Uh, and yet people uh, want to play politics with the issue. We've, uh, I'm about to the point where I think we're going to have to have some type of a commission that actually makes real recommendations that is then forced to put be those proposals put before Congress without amendment, vote up or down on it. And actually, that, that's maybe the way it's going to have to. You know, be done. one of the things I've thought about in that regard, we've actually ne- we've never submitted it, but I've drafted up legislation to look at this. 
uh, in our office. I'd love your reaction. It's not fair to do it right now, but it, it's we have a 45 percent trigger, as you know, on Medicare, which says only 45 percent of the money funding it can come out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we have to address it. And that might be the mechanism at which point you could put in commission recommendations across the board that it's either this or a tax increase, uh, you know, and give Congress the, the choice right. of which it wanted to do. Uh, and I think most of the time it would uh, opt for the reforms uh, as opposed to raising people's Medicare taxes yeah. because, again, that hits every single wage earner on every single dollar that sure. they make. Well, and, and we we're, we're have to do something. We just cannot let this this 900-pound gorilla sit out there and not address the the needs of the future. And uh, uh, whether it's a commission, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you doing town meetings like I do, and uh, going back to 19 what 82 when they had the the last Social Security reform and they created the notch and mm -hmm. things like that. You still hear about yeah. things like that at town meetings, of course. Uh, the brave souls back then, you know, passed it in '82, and then I don't think it went in, anything went into effect for five years after people had gone through a couple cycles on their elections. And uh, it uh, certainly, uh, whether you have to do it that way or what, it's to defer the pain, I guess. But we've got it. We've got to address the problem. Yes, I had a former member tell me once that he spent all his time condemning the things that he had done <laughs> <laughs> in order to insulate himself sure. going forward. So I'm glad we did them, and now it's about time we're going to have to address these pretty tough yeah. issues uh, again. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this again, though, on the appropriations process. Um, what are I think most people don't have a very clear understanding about how the Appropriations Committee is structured to go about its work. Could you just lay out what the structure is on sure. that committee and how they proceed in their business? Well, there are uh, 12 subcommittees on appropriation, which, in fact, we divide up every aspect of the federal government. So there is not one dollar that's spent that doesn't actually go through the appropriations process. Now, having said that, about two-thirds of the budget is either entitlement spending or interest on the national debt, which is automatic spending. So you end up with about one-third of the budget that is true discretionary. Uh, about half of that is military spending, and then you have another large chunk in Homeland Security. Those are two separate subcommittees. Uh, there are... You know, chairman, ranking member of each of those subcommittees. They have individual bills. They are the, the, the 12 bills that actually have to pass Congress every year to be able to fund the government. And that's why uh, oftentimes people uh, get upset with the uh, appropriators or whatever, but uh, uh, because those bills are the only ones, you know, trains leaving the station as they talk about. Oftentimes, there's a lot of authorizing language that's attached to those bills, and that oftentimes is the reason that bills get hung up and veto threats and all this type of thing. It isn't usually the funding levels themselves. We're uh, obviously going to have, I think, probably a pretty contentious uh, appropriation session this year. How Absolutely. do you see things going forward? Uh, where do you think the big flashpoints on spending will be? Well, certainly uh, on the military uh, portion of it that you're so involved with. Uh, there's going to be a huge debate uh, in that regard. Uh, I, you know, Things like Homeland Security, normally it's just a matter of finding uh, a, a budget number and, and going forward. Uh, you're going to have a lot of the initiatives that every administration puts forth uh, in their budget. Uh, you know, they always say the president proposes and Congress disposes. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I have a land grant university in my district. I serve on the agriculture. Uh, uh, one of my subcommittees is ag, and we fund all the research. Well, the previous administration, the Clinton administration, this administration, they always want to take away the formula funding that goes to the universities and uh, because they want to have everything on competitive basis. But what that would do would be basically to undermine long-term basic research in agriculture. So we'll have that battle. But uh, uh, flash points this year, uh, you're always going to find different uh, uh, 
uh, riders on bills that will cause flashpoints. You'll find the funding level certainly as last year when the, the majority of the Democrats here in Washington wanted to spend $23 billion more than what the President wanted. Uh, we all you know, stood tall and tough and basically they capitulated on that number. So that what, we, what would something like that, that it sounds like in a, in a of course multi-trillion dollar budget, doesn't sound like all that much money. What's that translate into as you look over a five-year period if you were to put something like that in place? See, that that's the thing. You're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars down the road because if you put that extra $23 billion in last year, that establishes a new higher baseline. And then you're talking about percentage increases on top of that. You know, I talked earlier about the miracle of compounding dollars, but that's exactly what it is. So you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years to just uh, meet that small, in comparatively small, I mean, $23 billion, a lot of money, but in the whole budget, uh, uh, you know, it, it, the growth of the federal government is, is on based on the, uh, the baseline and the percentage increases over that. Uh, we've got uh, a real struggle. I think this year the House uh, will probably get their work done as far as moving the 12 bills off the floor of the House of Representatives. The majority in the House can do about anything. Uh, the problem is the Democrat leadership over in the Senate here has decided they're not even going to do appropriations this year. So we're going to be in the same type of mess that what we were last year again. Uh, we'll have an election and we'll come back after the election, try to clean up the appropriation bills probably in another huge omnibus bill where a lot of mischief happens, unfortunately. Uh, and a lot of additional spending goes in. A lot of things are stuck in the middle of the night that people hate, and I hate as much as you do, I know. Uh, but that, that's probably what's going to happen because there is, doesn't seem to be any plan around here as far as actually getting the work done. Well, and without drawing you into a political discussion, but uh, just as a practical guy and a guy that's dealt with these problems for a number of years, will the outcome of the election, you know, who wins and loses, really impact what happens in that November sure. and December session? Absolutely it will. It, it will determine uh, who is going to uh, have to live with the budget and, and the next Congress, basically. And the outcome of this election will have a huge impact, certainly on the presidential side, because uh, we get back after the election, if you have a very liberal person as a president-elect, the Democrats are going to hang for way more spending when they try to get the final omnibus bill. And they've already said that uh, we're not going to do a lot of this work until uh, next March, uh, you know, over a year from now because they want they think they're going to have a real liberal in the White House to be able to spend a whole bunch more money and uh, but if if a more fiscal conservative person were elected uh, were the president elect that would have a huge impact as far as the budget outcome and I think we'd probably get our work done yet before the year's over yeah the removal of that the discipline of that veto really has tremendous consequences absolutely does and that's uh, because of the president's uh, uh, veto last year, and that's why we were able to end up saving the taxpayer the $23 billion. Well, Congressman, we're just about out of time, but I uh, wanted to thank you for coming out today and joining us on the show. Certainly appreciate your service in the United States House, to our country, and uh, obviously to Iowa, my second home. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Cole on Congress. Till next time, this is Congressman Tom Cole from our nation's capital. Thanks for joining us.